as we sang that song, we talked about knocking down walls in our life, and as we talk about adjusting to you this morning, God, I just pray that everyone here will have an open heart and an open mind to that, that we'll just declutter ourselves for a little bit, all the things we have in our brains that, that keep us sometimes from focusing on you, and God, that we'll do that this morning, and I ask these things in your son's name, amen. So I, I get the privilege this morning of, of sharing a message with y'all, and you know, um, when we were planning out experiencing God and things like that, we Grant uh, asked if uh, John would preach and I would preach, which we were glad to do. And then I'm like, great, I get adjusting my life to God, right? So, and you know, I it's good because I need this myself, and that's why I simply titled the message "Adjusting My Life to God" because we go through our life, and you know, there are many different adjust adjustments that we make throughout life. You know, when it comes to our response to God, but. We've going, been going through experiencing God, and in doing so, we learn that when we sense the direction of God, and we've received His invitation to join Him, excuse me, in what He wants to do through us, we come to a, a crisis of belief, which, you know, the word crisis a lot of times isn't um, the most positive word, but in this respect, it definitely is, because we need to get to that point, you know, where we can ask ourselves, do, do I really believe that God can do through me what He's calling me to do. And I've been there in my own life, and you know, once we've settled that question with hopefully a resounding yes, then we're supposed to demonstrate our faith by making whatever adjustments in our life might be necessary to obey God. And you know, that will always be the order of our responding properly to the call of God. And I'm actually going to go through quite a few uh, passages of Scripture today, so if you have your Bible, we're going to start off... Uh, in Philippians, and it's chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And most of you are probably familiar with these verses, but, you know, in preparing for this message and reading this passage of Scripture, I remember talking to Elizabeth and thinking that, you know, I, it, it's hard to get my mind around just personally that, that Jesus actually responds to God as well. And I think you're going to see that in this passage of Scripture. So again, this is chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. It says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he, not, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor, and gave him the name above all other names, that the name of Jesus, or excuse me, <clears throat> that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So there's a lot of interesting things there. When looking at that passage of Scripture, we see that the Son had to make some adjustments before he could obey the Father. You know, and in doing so, join the Father in the work of world redemption, which we can do as well. And he made the necessary adjustments, which we see in verses 6 and 7, so that he could obey, which we see in verse 8, and receive the resulting reward, which we see at the end there. And in the same way, you know, when we sense God's call to take a step of obedience in our walk with him, <clears throat> excuse me, and determine to respond by faith to his call, that we will first have to make the necessary adjustments to walk in obedience, which isn't always easy. And once we do that, we can then obey and be blessed as we receive the rewards that accompany that step of obedience to God. And, you know, I was really doing some self-reflection when thinking about that and that passage of Scripture, and I thought about my own life and, you know, different points in my life, especially uh, when it came to being called to ministry, because I was called to ministry uh, later in life, and um, I, I haven't been to seminary or anything like that, and uh, I was in my 30s and um, was helping with youth here at the church, and I really felt uh, God calling me to full-time ministry. And, you know, I was thinking about, so, so how I responded to that and, and what obedience looked like when it came to that call. Um, and I remember uh, at that point in my life, I, I was probably at the, at the best I had been with my walk with the Lord, I should say. So I was, you know, reading my Bible daily. I was really focusing on Him and what He would have for my life. And when I started feeling burdened by His call in my life, I, I re started to respond to it. At first, I kind of pushed it away and, you know, um, 
was like, oh, I'm just stressed, you know, that's just stress talking, and I talked to uh, my wife about it, and, you know, she's like, oh, yeah, you're stressed out, right? So she was agreeing with me. She's like, you know, I didn't marry a pastor. What is going on, you know? Not that that's a bad thing, but that was just wasn't, you know, where our life was going. We had our own plans, and, um, you know, I, I kept struggling, kept struggling, and God kept speaking to me, and, you know, it came down to just surrendering myself to Him. That was the only way that I could respond to his call in my life was completely like giving myself up to him. Like, here I am, use me however you want to use me. And, and as Christians, we all have to come to that point. And it's not just because, you know, not everybody in here obviously is going to be a pastor or a minister. But we still have to completely, you know, unburden ourselves with everything else and give our, our lives completely to God. And, and when I did that, that's when I knew what I needed to do. I mean, God was able to use me then because of obedience. So with that said, what kind of adjustments might we have to make in order to obey the call of God? You know, a lot of times the adjustments we might have to make in our lives in order to obey God fall into a couple categories. And the first one is an adjustment regarding our attitude. So, and it talks about that in verses 5 through 7 in relation to Jesus Christ. And, you know, Scripture shows us that the attitude of the Son that put him in a, excuse me, a position to obey the Father. His attitude was that any price was worth paying in order to join the Father in doing His will. And that's convicting to me. That Jesus was to that point as well. And God's invitation to us will also require a, a similar attitude if we'd be in a position to obey. We can't obey unless we have that attitude. With regard to whatever is required to obey the Father's call, we have to have the attitude that any sacrifice that might be necessary to God, or excuse me, to God's will is worth making in light of the inevitable reward of obedience. Any sacrifice is worth making. And I'm going to talk about some people in Scripture here in a little bit who, who made a lot of sacrifices. You know, and it was this attitude that enabled Jesus to obey the call to sacrifice himself on the cross for our sake. And think about if he wouldn't have been obedient. You know, Hebrews 12, 2 states it this way, Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. You know, obeying God will always require an adjustment in our attitude regarding the worth of whatever sacrifice is required to obey him. And I think that's what makes it that much richer in our lives when it comes to obedience is because we are having to, to give up something of ourselves. And I want to, let's jump to Luke, and this is chapter 18, uh, verses 18 through 27, and this is the story of the rich man. And we can look here and see how this relates to this as well. So, <clears throat> I'll let you guys get there. Luke 18, 18 through 27. Verse 18 says, Once a religious leader asked Jesus this question, Good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? What do you, or excuse me, why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. And the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. When Jesus heard his answer, he said, There is still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Not the answer this guy wanted. But when the man heard this, he became very sad because he was very rich. And when Jesus saw this, he said, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this said, Then who in the world can be saved? He replied, What is impossible for people is possible of God. So here's this guy, asked Jesus, Look, how do, how do I inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus tells him, You know, well, you've got to obey my commandments. Well, I've done that. I do that, right? Which many of us have probably been there ourselves. And then he goes, Well, okay, fine. You've got to give up everything. You've got to sell everything you own, and you've got to give it to the poor. So, you know, he wanted eternal life, but he didn't want to make the necessary adjustment to Jesus. His money and his wealth were more important. And it doesn't just have to be about money. You can replace money and wealth there 
with anything. It could be your time, your family, all these different things. Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that an adjustment had to be made in this man's life regarding his worship of money and wealth before he could enter into a personal relationship with God. He knew the man's heart. His money had become his God. The young ruler refused to make that necessary adjustment. And he missed out on a reward, excuse me, on a reward of experience, experiencing eternal life. And you know, the rich young ruler's love of money and greed uh, had made him an idolater. It was his idol in his life. And he missed coming to know the true God and Jesus Christ, whom God had sent. He wanted eternal life, but he refused to make the necessary adjustments in his life to the true God. It, I mean, he sat there and he heard what Jesus said, and he still refused. So I wanted to give something in contrast here, and this is just a little snippet uh, of Elisha, and it's in 1 Kings 19, and it's verses 19 through 21. And I had a slide this morning, and I had it all screwed up, so I, I deleted it. So I'll say that again. Uh, 1 Kings 19, and it's, it's verses 19 through 21. And again, this is a little bit of a contrast when it comes to Elisha. It says, So Elijah went and found Elisha, son of uh, Shaphan, plowing a field. There were twelve teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with twelve, <clears throat> excuse me, with the twelfth team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders, and then walked away. Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah, and said to him, First, let me go and kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. Elijah replied, Go on back, but think about what, you, what I have done to you. So Elisha returned to his ox and slaughtered them. He used the wood for the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople. They all ate. And then he went with Elijah as his assistant. So pretty, pretty strong contrast there. You know, in order to obey God, Elisha had to leave his family and career as a farmer in order to follow God's call. So he was plowing, he comes up, he's like, hey, yeah, you can go with me. Well, first, can I go say goodbye to my family? And then, you know, he tells him what to do. And he goes back and obviously he, it says he slaughtered all of his oxen, right? And then, and then burned the plow and all that stuff. So when reading that, you know, you've heard the phrase, you know, burning your bridges behind you, right? Well, the Bible says that Elisha burned his farm equipment and killed his 24 oxen. He cooked the meat, fed the people of the community with it. And, and to me, when I'm reading that, I'm like, he is not about to turn back. I mean, he has literally severed everything right then. There's nowhere to go back to. He has completely destroyed his livelihood, so to speak, in human terms, so he could follow God. He doesn't have anything to turn back to. You know, when he made the necessary adjustments, he was in a position to obey God. And as a result, God worked through life and performed some of the greatest signs and miracles recorded in the Old Testament, which is awesome. You know, Elisha had to make these adjustments on the front end of his call. You know, it, it's the same for, for you and I. You know, a lot of times we, we don't do that. Every time God calls us to obey, before we can do so, we have to adjust our attitude at the outset and determine that whatever sacrifice is necessary is worth making in order to obey the call of God. We need to do that at the outset. So the second thing is an adjustment... Uh, regarding our actions. So we talked about attitude. Now we're going to talk about actions, like it says in verse 8. You know, the, the son took action to make the adjustments necessary to obey the father, and, and we have to do the same thing. You know, we can't stay where we are and follow God. We can't. Following his call will always require taking the necessary actions to adjust our lives so that, so that we can obey. You know, Noah, and just some examples for you, Noah could not continue life as usual and build an ark at the same time. And Pastor Grant talked about Noah last week. I mean, he couldn't just keep doing what he was doing and, and build an ark as well. No, God called him to do that, and that consumed him. That's what he, he had to do in order to be obedient to God. And Abram couldn't stay in Ur or Haran and father a nation in Canaan. Moses couldn't stay on the backside of the desert herding sheep and stand before Pharaoh at the same time. David had to leave his sheep to become king. Amos had to leave the sycamore trees in order to preach in Israel. Jonah had to leave his home and overcome a major pre prejudice in order to preach in Nineveh. P 
Peter, Andrew, James, and John had to leave their fishing businesses in order to follow Jesus. Matthew had to leave his tax collector's booth to follow Jesus. Paul had to completely change directions in his life in order to be used of God to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And you know, those are just a few examples of the many in Scripture where people had to abandon themselves to, to follow God. You know, God will always make clear what actions we need to take in order to adjust and get in a position to obey Him because he, he actually wants to bless us. I was just talking to the youth last week and, you know, so many people have this, this picture of God being this, this, you know, cosmic killjoy who's just up there, you know, to, to laugh when we're in our misery. But God actually wants to bless us, but we first have to obey. You know, not only can we not stay where we are and follow God, but we cannot follow God and stay the same. We can't follow God and stay the same. You know, when we accept Christ as our Savior, there, there should be a change or a desire within us to change. Because there are going to be some things in our life that we need to leave, you know. And, and so many times, you know, in talking to a lot of people about the gospel, people, there's some things people aren't ready to give up or don't want to give up. They're not ready to accept Christ because of sin in their life that they're not ready to, to let go of. But we can't follow God and stay the same. You know, and each time God calls us to a new step of obedience in our walk with Him, He's calling us to change in some way. You know, and each change is designed to, to make us more like Jesus. That's what it's all about. It's not about being perfect. Obviously, you know, um, and I always tell my wife, I just, I don't like when people say, oh, you're going to mess up. You're going to, because to me that's setting people up to fail. We know that. We know that we have sin in our lives. And even after we accept Christ, you know, there, there's still, you know, that ability within us to sin. But we should be trying to be like Jesus. And in doing so, that will, will keep that stuff from polluting our life. And if we go back to Philippians 2 and verses 6 through 8, it said, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave, was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. You know, we're, we're never so much like Jesus as when we determine that any sacrifice is worth making in order to follow God. And then take whatever action is necessary to obey Him and be rewarded by Him. You know, this is what Jesus was referring to when He said in Luke 9, 23 and 24. Then He said to them all, If anyone would come after Me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow Me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but for whoever loses his life for me will save it. And I also looked this up in the message because this passage of Scripture reads, um, it, it, it really communicates what he's saying here. It says, and this is the message version, uh, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to finding yourself, your true self. What good would it do to get everything you want and lose you, the real you? You know, I was thinking about that. It is all about self-sacrifice when it comes to obedience. So, you know, I wanted to ask you today, how is God calling you to take up your cross? How is He doing that today? What has God been doing in your own life that, that you know that you need to take up your cross? How is he calling you to obey him? Like what, what adjustments are you going to have to make in order to do so? And I, I was thinking about all the different adjustments we have to make. And sometimes it's in our circumstances, like our job or our home or our finances. Or maybe it's your relationships, your marriage, your family, your friends, your business associates. Or your, your thinking, maybe prejudices, methods, your potential or your commitments to, to family, to church, to job, to plans, tradition, your activities like how you pray, how you give, how you serve, how you spend your free time, your beliefs, you know, about God, His purposes, His ways, yourself, your relationship to Him. Like, where is it? You know, whatever changes or sacrifices I may have to make in order to obey God are always worth it because it's only in embracing my cross that, that I can fulfill my God-given destiny. And that's the same for everyone. 
We, we have to do that in our life. You know, so which will it be? Will you, will you waste your life or will you invest your life? Will you live for yourself or for your Savior? Will you follow the way of the crowd or the way of the cross? And I know it sounds like, wow, I mean, you know, that's, that's a pretty... That's a pretty harsh statement, but it's true. And when it comes to Jesus, you know, I've found in my own life it is about sacrifice. And there's plenty, I'm pointing fingers at myself too, that I daily have to, to fight. But I know that when we sacrifice, it's when God can truly use us and, and truly bless us. And there's so many areas of our life, especially in the world that we live in today, that are consumed by everything else but God. You know, we, we allow those things to steer and direct us and guide us. And that's where we find maybe our value, our worth is in the things of this world, even as Christians. And, and we can't do that. We have to focus on the Lord. And, you know, I was debating on how I wanted to end talking today. And uh, I really felt led to share something with you. And we're having a conference, you know, for parents. And you can go to that slide there. And this isn't a plug. I mean, it is a plug, but it's not. But it, it's a great example of adjusting our life to God. Because, you know... Um, I really felt led to do this since I've been here. I've wanted to have a parent conference at our church, and uh, for many reasons, but most of all, to partner with you as parents, because as a youth pastor, I'm not very effective unless I'm partnering with you uh, to help you with your students, and uh, we're going to be having a conference, and it's April 21st and 22nd, and it's, it's a Friday evening and a Saturday morning. And I know everybody has busy schedules and, and all that, but, you know, this is something I think that could really help you as a parent, not because I have all the answers, but because we're going to look at Scripture and see what God has for us when it comes to parenting. And uh, this is something for, for anyone who's interested, you know, ideally for probably fourth grade up, if you have a fourth grader and up, but if you have younger kids than that and you feel like you could benefit from a parenting conference, then please join us as well. But I think that sometimes, you know, we get so busy, and I've said this to the students recently, you know, with all these other things in life that um, we don't make time for the important things. And things like this are important because it's an investment in your family. It's an investment uh, here at church, too, because it can get you associated with youth ministry, and we can serve alongside each other and, and you know, do kingdom work. And I... I really hope that some of you will, will sign up and be a part of this. We've already got some people signed up out there. It's completely free. We're paying for it uh, as a church. And, you know, uh, there's going to be child care. We're going to feed you. All those things are covered. All you have to do is sign up and show up. And you will be done by 1 o'clock at the latest on Saturday. So you'll have the rest of your day to do whatever you need to do. And uh, some of you in here will like, I've, I've already graduated my kids, you know. And that's great, but guess what? You can still serve in our church and do kingdom work and be obedient to God. And that's kind of what today's ser uh, sermon is all about, is about adjusting so we can serve the Lord how we need to. But I hope that um, as a parent you'll be a part of this. And um, it's going to be a great weekend, and I'm looking forward to it myself just so I can see how I can serve you better and, and partner with you as well. And I'm thankful for pastors in our church who are willing to teach and be a part of it and, and support it also. But, you know, I, I put on your connection card this morning two simple things. Uh, one is that you'll attend, attend the parenting conference. But the most importantly there is I will invest my life, live for my Savior, and I will follow the way of the cross. You know, and we are focusing today as Palm Sunday, as Grant said earlier, and we're focusing on Jesus. And we're, we're rejoicing today. But, you know... We talked today about how Jesus, you know, had to adjust himself to be on that cross. And, you know, then we come back next Sunday and we celebrate that he's risen. And I ask that, that you'll focus on that this week and think about how you can invest your life, live for your Savior, and, and follow the way of the cross as we focus on that this week. So let's pray. Dear God, I am thankful for your word and the truth that's there. God, I'm thankful for this church and the people in it. God, I ask that, that if there's someone in here today who's burdened, God, that they'll release that and they'll adjust themselves to you. And God, I, I pray that for all of us, that when it comes to obedience, God, that we will all be willing to do what we need to do in order to be obedient to you. God, use us how, however we need to be used when it comes to your kingdom. And God, help us help you and however we can. And God, I ask this morning also to be with us as we 
continue to, to focus on you as a church through experiencing God, that you will open up more, more doors in our lives. God, maybe if there's pain or hurt, or God, maybe if there's some serious adjustments that need to be made, that you'll do that. And I ask all these things in your son's name. Amen.